the overall theme of COGEX this year is how do we get the next 10 years right? And for us in the UK creative industries, that means how do we invent, master and manage the new world where creativity meets technology? Our next session has been curated by Digital Catapult, the UK's leading advanced digital technology innovation center with a remit to drive early adoption of new technologies to make UK businesses more competitive and productive in order to grow the country's economy. The session topic is emerging tech and its challenges and opportunities, looking at the future of innovation in the creative industries and the vital need for support. The session comes in two parts, a scene setting fireside chat and a panel discussion. And hosting the session is Digital Catapult CEO, Dr. Jeremy Silver. Jeremy is an entrepreneur, author, angel investor. He also leads on R&D and innovation strategy for the Creative Industries Council. A big welcome to Jeremy. Thanks very much, Janet, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's well, it's uh, really great to be here. Uh, slightly surreal experience for all of us. Um, you know, uh, normally when we do these kinds of things, we have a sense of who's in the room. And, and to be honest with you today, I have absolutely no idea who any of you are or how many of you there are. But nonetheless, we will continue uh, and hopefully bring you something intriguing and insightful uh, uh, with some uh, very distinguished speakers this morning. So uh, it's my real pleasure, um, first of all, uh, to begin, as Janet said, with a little bit of a scene setting conversation uh, with Andrew Thompson. Uh, Andrew is the executive chair of the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, that is one of the nine research councils within UKRI. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Andrew is, is, is a professor of global and imperial history uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, and uh, uh, he, I think more than anybody else in the, in the arts and humanities has been responsible for raising funds for research and development in this field um, in the tens of millions. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us this morning, Andrew. And um, I, I thought that we, uh, we would start really with a conversation uh, about innovation and about the sort of emerging technology opportunities um, for the creative industries. Um, but I thought that perhaps what I would begin by asking you was really, uh, given the scale and the, and the depth of, of the pandemic's impact uh, and, and the severity with which some sectors in particular uh, are really threatened by, by COVID, um, what do you think the role for, for research and development is in, in that context? It's a very interesting question, Jeremy. I mean, um, I think in so many ways, uh, we are living through a period of massive experimentation in the ways that we've been living and, and working during this crisis. And that, of course, includes the cultural and creative industries. And in many ways, it's been culture more than perhaps anything else that we've turned to for comfort and consolation during this crisis and to try and give us a perspective on the times in which we live and to remind us of those values that, dare I say it, that make us human. And I think what's been interesting for the, the two programmes that we run at the moment, the Creative Clusters programme, and the audience of the future program is thinking about how the the digital world has been able to bring culture into our homes during this sort of period of, of lockdown as we've come to call it uh, what what are the potential and what the possibilities of all of that but also i think not to be too panglossian about it at the same time you know are, are there are there limitations as well uh, and I'm very mindful as I, I say all of that is that there may be another truth of, the, of this virus um, in broad terms has been the remarkably differential impact that it's had on our society and our economy. Uh, hugely variable. And that's true of our arts and cultural life as well. And many people may be listening who are uh, involved with, employed by, um, patrons of uh, venues that have had to close down earlier on in this crisis that maybe will be some of the last things to be able to emerge from it when they reopen their doors and where life is really tough at the moment and where digital isn't necessarily the, the salvation either 
Um, so a lot to talk about. And, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right to, to, to raise that and identify that. And, and clearly, um, you know, that we, well, I hope that we're going to see more steps and more measures to help um, those businesses recover um, and continue to be able to be ex in existence over, the, over, the, over this forthcoming period. Uh, you mentioned audience of the future and the creative clusters. Um, they are perhaps the two largest um, research and development projects that we've seen um, applied to the creative industries and sort of approaching the scale of, uh, of investment that is more traditionally seen uh, in, say, the automotive sector or, or in pharmaceuticals. So it's, it's really exciting to see that sort of investment coming into creative industries and, and, and a sense acknowledging the importance of the sector for the economy as a whole. Um, what's your sense of, 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 of how those projects have engaged uh, and have reached out to companies in the community and are making an impact? Um, there is one of the creative clusters we support um, is up in Scotland in Dundee Abertay, focusing on the gaming industry. You're very familiar with it yourself. And they described it um, well in a recent brochure that we published on the Creative Clusters program. Of course, it wasn't the case. It emphatically wasn't the case that either our Creative Clusters or Audiences of the Future program invented collaboration between our le leading universities and our cultural and creative industries. But one that Dundee Abertay's cluster said was that to a certain extent, before those programs, uh, these collaborations were serendipitous. And what these two investments have been helping is to make them more systematic and more structured. So I think what the programmes are about is creating new, a new infrastructure for our university sector in all of its diversity and, uh, and breadth, because this is not just the research intensive universities in the Russell Group, it is there. But actually, it's the really the length and the breadth of the sector, you know, all the way down from sort of Bournemouth up to Dundee, sort of Abertay. Um, we have these interactions going on and it's providing an infrastructure, the resources, the money um, and uh, and the backing um, to help systemize those collaborations and, uh, and make them uh, uh, a more regular occurrence. But just to give people a, a flavour of this, Andrew, because it, 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 I think, you know, it's quite a high level um, that you're talking at. But I just wonder whether just to give people a sense of, you know, if individual companies who may not be familiar with, with uh, you know, with working with universities in that way. And I think, you know, generally there's, a, there's a, a, an ambition here to increase that relationship and increase the number of companies involved. Just can you give us a flavour of you know, the way in which individual companies may have benefited from uh, working in one of the creative clusters, for example. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I was going to go on to say, I mean, you, you've just taken the words out of my mouth, that um, this is often um, about um, small creative and digital companies, about freelancers too. It's not just about the, the larger companies and the, the bigger beasts. And I think for those freelancers and smaller creative, digital, immersive, interactive companies, they didn't necessarily know what the right routes or the best routes were into their local regional universities. And this is a world I think that the cultural and creative industries are, are, are familiar with these um, companies, but actually Westminster and Whitehall and our leading universities aren't necessarily. So if you take Factory 42, this will be a name that's probably familiar to many people listening uh, to this event, if not everybody. And they are working with the Natural History Museum and the Science Museum, taking the latest immersive technology, this is glasses, not goggles, um, from Magic Leap, from the west coast of the USA, into those two leading museums to put our new mixed augmented reality experiences. They're called dinosaurs and robots, and they'll be launching fairly soon. It's really exciting if you've actually been in there. And uh, I took our former Secretary of State, Nikki Morgan, into the Natural History Museum to try it, try it. And it's absolutely at the cutting edge of technology. It really is. But Factory 42 and John Cassie, who's the really dynamic CEO of that organization, they were five people before this program started. 
and they're now 25 people as, as a result of the, the work that they're doing on the Audience of the Future programme. So what we hope is that it will give lots of companies who haven't had the opportunity to think about how R&D can benefit what they're doing and help them create new products and experiences for the market to work with researchers across the arts and humanities into the engineering and computing and physical sciences to help them in a pre-commercial pre way with what they're doing. Of course, um, you know, people would say that the um, working with robots and dinosaurs is the sort of digital equivalent of performing with animals and children, uh, which is always regarded as being one of the more precarious things you can do. Uh, really interesting though, just give us a sense of, of, of where this goes um, in terms of the, the future, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing these, these programs are now a couple of years through, uh, that some of them are drawing to a close, um, but my guess is that you're, platting, you're planning and plotting the next uh, pathway forward. How do you see these evolving? Where does this go next? Yeah, I think that one of the things that we've done um, in the first few years of these programs is to provide the, the, the springboard and a catalyst for what's um, next. You were generous enough to say that this is the, the largest amount of research and innovation funding that we've ever seen in the UK into the creative and cultural industries. Uh, and these are, I think, genuinely the two biggest R&D programmes for the creative and cultural industries anywhere in the world. But nonetheless, compared to some other areas of the economy, this is relatively modest money that's going in. So I, I think what we should be thinking is ambition here. And um, we, we all know, we hear that it's a popular refrain that the creative and cultural industries are as big or bigger than aerospace and automotive combined, but don't have anything like the same levels of R&D funding going into them. And that's partly because when we think of R&D for the cultural and creative industries, we need to broaden our conception of what that is, because it might not be scientists working in labs all the time. It might be something different. And we are talking about innovation in content and innovation in culture as much as we're talking about innovation in the technology at the same time. But I do think that coming out of these programmes that hopefully are going to be a springboard to something even bigger and even better, and will work with the infrastructure we've got, rather than trying to sort of wipe the slate clean and sort of, you know, uh, start completely afresh and build out of those clusters and technology demonstrators as an audience of the future, we'll be thinking about some pretty big questions. So, you know, once you go into the digital immersive interactive space and you think about presence, what does it really mean to provide users with a sense of sufficient presence at a remote event to make that event compelling? We ought to have some real interesting learning about that and be able to articulate that and what it means for next investments. Or if you take narrative, if you're in the interactive or immersive space, you've got challenges as well as opportunities of telling stories in space as well as in time. Well, what have we learned about that? Or if you take the live audience, if you can capture real-time audience data and collect it and feed it back those experiences, yeah, in real time, what difference does that make to a performance? So I think there's an awful lot of learning that should come out of these programs that inform then the next round of, uh, of projects that benefit. Excellent, excellent. Andrew, thank you so much. Um, I, I, obviously, enormous questions that uh, you've raised there right at the end. And unfortunately, we're, we're sort of at the end of our slot here because um, all you've done is scratched the surface and pointed to all these incredible things that we should be then spending hours and, uh, uh, and no doubt years continuing to explore. So thank you so much, Andrew. Um, uh, I think there is actually a separate um, presentation later on on this agenda from Andrew Chitty, who runs the uh, Audience of the Future programme and Creative Clusters programme. So there'll be more detail for those who want to see more about that. Um, so, Andrew, thank you for the taster you've given us, but also for the clues about where this all goes. Uh, Andrew Thompson, thank you very much. So uh, we're going to move now from um, a, a little one-on-one -on -one chat there to uh, something a little bit more uh, collective. And uh, I'm delighted to invite onto this virtual stage, which I hope you're finding to be as compelling an experience as, as, as I am, uh, our, our guests on this panel. Uh, Rebecca gregory Clark, who's head of immersive for uh, Story Futures Academy, which is part of the National Film and, uh, and Television School. Uh, Dave Bull, who is uh, Creative Technologies Lead and Professor of Signal Processing. Um, at the uh, uh, director of Bristol Vision Institute at the University of Bristol. Uh, and last but certainly not least, 
Uh, Emma Lloyd, real pleasure. Emma, uh, who is Chief Business Development Officer uh, for the Sky Group. And uh, uh, well, I hope that you you picked up a little bit um, on, uh, on on what Andrew was saying there. Uh, and I think there was an implication in that um, fairly strongly of the, the power of, of the kind of set of technologies that we talk about as immersive technologies uh, as being a real uh, growth opportunity. But Emma, perhaps I could just start with you uh, and, and ask you, obviously, uh, you know, given the, the, the whole pandemic that we're all still immersed in, um, this has led to the, the freezing of production. It's led to a, a, a requirement of companies like yours to completely reorganize the way that you've thought about your, your processes. Um, and I, I get a sense that that's just be, you're beginning to come out of the other side of that now. Um, but how would you say this has impacted you in particular from a Sky perspective? Yes, um, obviously, you know, as, as an organization that has both a lot of drama productions um, that have to be paused, um, but also an organization with a 24 hour news operation in Italy um, and in the UK, we, we essentially um, had to start innovating very early, particularly uh, initially with our Italian news organization and starting to figure out actually how we could, could keep, um, keep our staff safe, but keep, um, keep that on air. And actually um, it was the experience that we had in Italy that then was shared with the UK team and Sky News obviously um, uh, picking that up. And as we now start to look at bringing back the, um, the entertainment productions, there's a huge amount of learning actually from the news team that's now going into the drama, drama side of things. Uh, and Gary Davey, who heads up Sky Studios, um, is putting in place a lot of protocols, as I know um, all production companies are across the UK. So I think we can start to feel now that, that um, things will start to come back, albeit, um, you know, with many, many changes. And, and do you think, I mean, it's, it's really interesting that, that, you know, I mean, reeling from the, from the initial impact and then lots and lots of ingenuity coming into place. And clearly that the, the, the experience that we've all had and, and that we're currently having of working in this way of, of video conferencing like this has shifted people's thought process. I mean, it has kind of given one a sense that, that actually more change is possible than perhaps we might have imagined and more rapidly so, given the sort of exigencies of the situation. What, what, what's your sense of, of, I mean, are there, is there a kind of silver lining to this for you? Do you, you know, you, you as an organization, um, you know, you've worked with a lot of innovative uh, companies that you've brought in to the to the to the picture. You've uh, really experimented with virtual reality, particularly with a number of your of your big series, creating these ancillary episodes to really try and introduce that that to, to audiences. What, what's your sense of where we go from here, and how how has that changed a bit since the pandemic? Yes, um, yeah, it's a great question, and um, just by total coincidence, actually, I was involved in a in a Sky Labs session. Um, that was looking to the, the future in 2030 and what's the sort of intersection of, of entertainment um, media and the, and the future of, of a connected home would look like in 2020 and, and working with a number of futurists from around the world. Two weeks into that process, obviously, we, were, we had to lock down and we ended up moving that whole process to remote, um, working with tools, you know, post-it tools like Miro and having to immediately try and find new ways of collaborating in this, as you say, in this environment. Um, but um, the irony was that what we were actually, you know, digging into and researching there was a number of trends um, that we've seen accelerate during these last few months. And I think um, certainly our conclusion is that that um, a number of things will uh, will have benefited from the strange times that we're in. And and that the whilst there's nothing I don't think necessarily fundamentally new, the acceleration and the behavioural change that's happening. Um, will mean that um, when we emerge into the new normal, a number of these things will be will um, have have accelerated, you know, months if not years. Um, and I think I, mean, that, I think the there's um, huge the, the, opportunity there. The, the CEO of Microsoft said that he thought that we'd moved forward um, in terms of sort of consumer digital consumption um, mm -hmm. in the space of two months by what it, he thought it would take two years at least. To actually have happened which is i suppose you know, global populations suddenly being able to be familiar with with, with video conferencing um yes does that but i i suppose what we haven't seen though is is and, and there are lots of good reasons for this 
you know, lots and lots of people suddenly in, in immersing themselves in VR or, or augmented reality suddenly becoming a thing. Is it, is it going to come more quickly because of this, do you think? It's interesting that from our perspective, um, you know, we, we got involved, um, as you know, Jeremy, in virtual reality right at the beginning when it wasn't clear at all um, you know, whether that was going to be relevant for our industry and invested in in a startup um, that helped us understand where that was going to go. And what we found is that whilst we launched Sky VR um, a number of years ago and we continue to produce content, as you say, for, for our VR application, um, what the team, Neil Graham, that heads up um, the, the virtual reality and augmented reality creative and production team here is that a number of those skills that the team have learned have now been applied to sort of mainstream media. So what you saw in Sky's, uh, uh, Sky News's election night coverage was actually pulling a number of, of assets um, from that were created for VR and AR into the, into the main production stream. Um, and then seeing experiences like uh, um, we created some shoulder programming for Bulletproof recently, one of our drama productions, which um, basically enabled um, the, uh, the viewers of that to keep engaged with the key characters between the between episodes and now between series. And so um, the sort of capabilities that that team have, have, have built on that initially seemed pretty niche are now becoming much more sort of mainstream and used across our business. Um, and as we start to now see the evolution into virtual production as well, um, and all the different pieces of that across the value chain, then again, it's fascinating that, that having invested in, in the skills and expertise there, they're now being applied in much broader ways, as well as obviously still in, in VR um, and increasingly now in AR as well. Really interesting, really interesting to see the way that, that, that some of that rather more futuristic stuff and that those technologies that are enabling that are actually now really embedding themselves in, in current methods and current techniques. D David, maybe I can turn to you. Dave Bull um, from, from Bristol, you, you've been doing quite a lot of work recently with, uh, with Netflix um, and, um, uh, and helping them uh, improve the efficiency of their streaming. And certainly it's, it seems as if the network has held up. So whatever it was you did must have been successful in some respects. Um, how, do, how, do you, how do you see this evolving? Let me, I mean, let me ask you the same question I asked Emma. From a, from a technology perspective, are you, do you get a sense that we're now in a place where some of these what felt like leading edge technologies are now actually going to be, be accelerated into the mainstream? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it's kind of interesting how well things have worked and how well collaborations have worked over there. The last few few months, they've surprised me. The kind of innovations that we've seen that I mean, a lot of them, a lot of us, including me, weren't really aware of um, if they existed before in terms of kind of meeting rooms and organisations of meetings and that sort of level. Um, but I mean, obviously, what you're referring to in terms of the work we do with with Netflix and and and, and others is in terms of optimising the content both. Uh, prior to delivery and during delivery and I think that is hugely important because you know we're still seeing that, are, that there are limitations um, this system is holding up pretty well it seems um, at the moment but we are still seeing limits and that tension between network capacity and the types of things that we want to transmit over the network so the, uh, the whole idea I think is getting come, come to the forefront much more in terms of how we how we represent information, audiovisual information, how we encode that information, how we adapt that to the content that's being transmitted, and you know the likes of Netflix and you know Sky and Drama, uh, Drama Sky and BBC and others uh, is very different to how you would want to encode, for example, sport, and the way we allocate the bits to that content. You know, is still a major challenge, and there's still a long way to go in terms of building more intelligence into into into, into the network. So those are sort of things that we we're doing, um, you know, across across the industry, optimizing the the content, understanding the content, allocating the bits in, in the best way, so that the person who's consuming them or the audience gets the best quality per bit transmitted and. I mean, certainly in the lab, we are, you know, we're looking at compression ratios, 
Um, if you compare the original content with what's being transmitted of you know a thousand to one, so you give me a thousand bits, I give you one bit back, and I try to tell you that's the same thing. And, and uh, the amazing thing is that there's still so much further to go in that space, isn't it? I mean, it, it seemed, you know, when uh, I mean, it's it's now twenty years that we've lived with MP3 and 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 and, M and MPEG's initial outcomes. And yet, you know, there's still work to do and still opportunity. Presumably, um, the use of AI uh, becomes a real theme there in, in terms of how you you really optimize the stream. And, and presumably, you, you can do that in a very sophisticated ways that varies over time during the course of a, of a single stream's life. Absolutely. Um, you know, I have to say, I mean, you mentioned 20 years, it's probably more than that. Um, <laughs> uh, but the the architectures that we're seeing today for for delivery of content although they've advanced um in many ways in terms of the tools that are, 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 that are available they've evolved let's say the basic architecture is the same as it was probably 40 years ago um which on one hand kind of tells you how how robust that architecture is but maybe also says other things about the reluctance you know to to change things i think there are that, you know, it's not always the best technology that wins. There are kind of lots of other reasons um, that might come into the technology that's that's adopted. But you mentioned AI, and that's that's a big big effort of of my group and many others around the world in terms of coding. It's perhaps less well. You think of AI, most people think of kind of searching and recognition and things like that. But of course, that you know, the computer vision aspect is really really important and related you know the more you can understand the content the more you can then allocate the bits to that content in the in the optimum way so that's the sort of thing that we're we're doing um and actually for for, for the most recent standard that's going to come out the uh, so-called versatile video coding mpeg standard that's going to come out um probably uh, later this year early next year um we we did put a submission into that uh, based on AI tools, and it um, it was um, one of the uh, best performing single tools that was submitted. However, there were obviously other limitations associated with AI tools that um, meant that it didn't go forward. Uh, there are other tools you mentioned Netflix, and there are a whole group of organisations that are um, linked through an organisation called the uh, Alliance of Open Media, and they are. Now producing, as I'm sure many people will be aware, uh, open standards. So um, you know, the issues with with kind of royalty bearing standards have caused some issues for big streaming organisations. Um, I think the next generation of AOM um, AV2, so called, will be more amenable to these these techniques. Um, you know, the, the partners such as Google and uh, others leading that technology. So they've got a mindset which is perhaps uh, slightly different. So, so again, we're putting this. So we're going to have, you've still got more to come in terms of benefiting from uh, more mobile capability, better definition coming into us in more flexible ways. So the richness of the experience is, is still there to improve upon, isn't it? And I think, you know, that that's what's so intriguing when you start to think about the, 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 the narrative context for all of this and how you tell stories and the sorts of uh, ways of telling stories in, in this context with, with with the richness of technological capability around it. So, Becky, turning to you, the Story Futures Academy is a, is a new organization, um, actually funded by Andrew Thompson's um, Audience of the Future program, uh, as you know. And um, uh, you've been doing an enormous amount of work there with, with a really a whole new generation of storytellers developing a, a entirely new ways of telling stories, but taking advantage uh, of the kinds of techniques that, that David's just been talking about. That's How, right. from, from, from your point of view, let me just ask you this question though. The, again, let me ask you the same question from the, the, the pandemic has had an impact on, on you in terms of how you running your courses, but what's your sense in terms of what your students are thinking about in terms of where this all goes from a narrative point of view? What impact is it gonna have on them? Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. So, uh, yes, as you say, um, the, um, the Story Futures Academy programme is the National Centre for Immersive Storytelling, and it is a joint programme between um, the National Film and Television School and Royal Holloway University of London. And we're essentially a big upskilling initiative. A lot of the work we do is with um, uh, 
people already working in the creative industries in some in some respects, often in the screen industries, but also wider than that, um, uh, and helping them to upskill and use immersive technologies for storytelling. Um, and yeah, as we go forward, we're also looking at, you know, at, at what this means for the future of um, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate courses and, and students coming through. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been a, a really interesting time because, of course, we're an educational programme, as, you know, as, as um, NFTS and World Holloway are um, anyway. Um, but it has a big practical element to it. Um, and um, I think anyone who's going through this at the moment, um, you know, trying to get through education, but also trying to do practical projects is, you know, having to really um, make a, a huge leap of faith with the way that they approach things. But I think, uh, I mean, one thing I think is true is that anybody who's, who's gone through these programmes at the moment will, you know, they'll have, have had a hard time of it, but they will end up being some of the most resourceful, um, I think, um, content makers and creatives that there are out there. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think, I think we will see some really interesting interesting work come out of the back of it as well. Um, but yeah, I think um, as, as this pandemic has um, uh, affected us all, it's, it's been interesting in, in sort of the immersive space because you see, um, uh, I have seen you know, some companies and, and creators maybe working games or animation, you know, uh, types of content that are maybe inherently a bit more digital anyway, and maybe a bit more, because uh, they don't rely on massive physical shoots, for example, people turning turning um, that way. Um, on the other hand, before the pandemic, there was a big trend to be looking at location-based immersive experiences, you know, where people would physically go to a place to experience them. And that sort of reversed a bit now. And, I, you know, at the start of this year, I did not see that coming particularly. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's been reflected in the, there's been a, an increased demand for consumer devices of head-mounted displays um, that actually haven't really kept up with what's available because there have been manufacturing problems with that as well. So it, we've seen a really interesting set of new trends. I think what will, it'll be fascinating to see which of these, you know, uh, you know hang over uh, as, as, you know, eventually come out of this. But I do think, as I say, one of what I hope to see is, um, uh, a sort of lasting legacy of just really resourceful content making, you know, people looking at virtual production te techniques, embracing the remote working in a way that even I would have said sounded impossible before, you know, and I've really had my eyes opened as well. Um, but um, uh, yeah, also in just um, uh, being able to uh, yeah, embrace this, this innovation because it really can, uh, it can actually stand you in good stead if you're already willing to do this kind of uh, virtual working. So do you think that, uh, you know, as you, as you kind of look at that shift and the, and the responses of, you know, on the part of, of students, as you say, some of whom are, have been around in the industry for a while and not, are not, not novices by any sense of the imagination, but, but I'm just wondering what your take is on, I mean, Emma made a really interesting comment that, that you know, so much of, this, uh, of these new emerging technologies that have been um, kind of, you know, imminent, but they've been imminent for about the last five, six, seven years, but so much of the, the thinking around that is starting to find its way into current productions and, and current methodologies. And I'm just wondering whether that's something that, that resonates with you as well. Is that something that you're seeing? Um, and, and what do you think about that? Because, you know, it's, I mean, that, you could read that in two different ways, couldn't you? Yeah. You could see that as a positive or you could see it as being a, a disappointment that, that some of these new things haven't happened more quickly. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, these... Um... I think anybody getting into immersive over the last few years, um, I think by and large, you sort of, it's important to accept that you're playing a long game in a way, you know, that these, um, uh, yes, there are, there are uh, innovations that happen at particular moments that give things a boost and get people excited. But, you know, I, I, I will always say to people coming through our labs, you know, don't get too attached to any particular device, for example, that you see right now. All of these things change all the time. And they're all, all they do is they're edging us closer to a, a world where these, you know, we can experience these, these immersive experiences either, either in the consumer sense or that we can embrace this kind of, you know, immersive storytelling and world building techniques as part of other kinds of content um, development, even if it's linear, linear films. Um, so, um, it, yeah, I think uh, it, it's, it's great to see this. I mean, the silver lining of this, you know, not this is not to say there are not many challenges to many companies working in this space at the moment. But yes, the, I think that the boost and 
the hopefully a, a slightly lowering of the barrier in terms or, or perhaps it's not lowering of the barrier maybe it's more of a, a a willingness and a drive to overcome the barrier to 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 use to use these things when you know out of necessity innovation by necessity maybe that's what we're seeing <laughs> yes yeah really interesting isn't it i mean I, I do wonder whether you know what we've sensed is that there's you know a massive cultural barrier has been breached that, that that sense that you know large scale consumer audiences can't actually get involved and, and work together you know using this kind of technology well it clearly is possible so i suppose the question is do we you know obviously that's to some extent it's going to go back to the way it was once this is all over but what what do you think the influence will be and and you know when we think about the the different ways in which uh, some of these technologies are not just Im impacting the opportunity for today, but also off opening up new opportunities. Emma, do you think that you are going to, does this, it's going to encourage Sky, is this going to encourage the sector more broadly, do you think, to try and push audiences into these new areas? Is, is, I mean, is it a business opportunity, do you think? Or, or in the end, do you think those, those traditional barriers that have kept it slow up to now are still going to be in place? What, what's the difference going to be, do you think? Yeah, so I, I definitely feel that this this has accelerated both the the appetite um, and the interest in the consumer um, end of the spectrum for these these types of experiences, um, but I also think um, and this is sort of I guess less empirical at the moment, but my my sense from seeing what's happening is that also um, you know within the the production side of the equation, there's going to be a greater appetite from all of those involved in the industry to adopt some of the tools that maybe would have taken longer to adopt. So uh, there, I'm talking about some of the some of the technologies in virtual production, which it feels like are going to be part of the way in which we open things up faster. Um, and you know, maybe before we were thinking about those things for efficiency and um, you know the 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 ability to add more effects for example but actually the reality is it's going to it's going to enable people to to work in a way that they've already now started to do but but in an even better fashion so i think it's for me it's both sort of consumer and um within the the underlying industry we're going to see an yes. acceleration of the adoption of these technologies i mean it's really interesting isn't it i mean the, the, the surge in demand that the streaming platforms have created is already there I mean that we were already experiencing. Obviously, the pandemic has, has accelerated that. Even though the productions may be lagging and there may be a challenge in the pipeline to come, and who knows how people are going to manage that. But uh, but this this sense of flexibility, lower cost, faster production times, but actually a real disruption to the the the, the process of production. Uh, and the Mandalorian is always the example that everyone gives about mm. this. I mean, is, is this um, you know how prevalent now is this going to be in the industry and how you know are, is it is there as much an economic pressure now to adopt some of these solutions because of the practical you know proven practical benefit or is it also a creative opportunity as well so so certainly from a sky perspective we're seeing it um you know predominantly as a as a creative opportunity but i think that this the pandemic has potentially made it more of a of a must from a practical perspective which will um you know whether, whether that flushes out um efficiencies or not we'll have to wait and see but i think that the creative opportunity was sort of where where our teams have started and as you say you know e even since the time that the mandalorian was created the innovation and the the um, progress that's been made is is really exciting and when you look at um you know the the uh recent announcements around what some of the game engines can do and the ability to move to real time which will be very important um for us as we look at some of these immersive experiences for sport um one of the things that's held us back there is is you know the the capability to do things in in real time and live and so i think that yeah we're, we're seeing that actually it's going to open up entirely new opportunities for at the um at that end of the spectrum which we're really excited about excellent david let me turn to you again uh, you know in terms of the, the sort of big opportunities and the big areas that we still haven't got sorted out or that technology sort of promises what are the great opportunities and promises on the horizon that we shall be, be thinking about now 
Uh, there are lots. Um, I, I guess one of the big underpinning things that we still don't do particularly well is understand our audiences. Andrew, Andrew touched on this in, in the in your introductory chat, and I think it's absolutely vital. I mean, if we're if we're kind of measuring the quality of content, we do that in very very simple ways. Basically, you know, we we don't currently understand enough about human sensory systems to, to actually embody that in kind of mathematical equations that will allow us to make those objective measurements. So people, you know, if you want to understand an audience, you kind of see what their reaction is, you ask them questions. Now, there is a move, and Andrew again mentioned uh, clusters, and it's one of the, one of the things that, uh, that we're doing in, in the cluster in Bristol and Bath. Um, a part of what we're doing is, is looking at trying to understand audiences better. And some work that, um, that we've done actually at Bristol uh, recently, combining across disciplines and really bringing psychologists and engineers and creatives together to try to get a better <laughs> handle on engagement and immersion, not just by asking questions or kind of seeing what reactions are, but actually measuring parameters. Now, obviously, you can do things like EEGs and very intrusive things like that, which are um, give you some information, but are, 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 as I said, intrusive. Um, so we're looking at much simpler measures um, that, that are non-invasive, non-intrusive, non where we can actually extract kind of parameters by observing audiences. And we're building a, we're, we plan to build a big facility to um, instrument an auditorium as well as individual uh, immersive experiences to, to do this, to get those basic parameters to fuse them well, together and what to, sort of things would you will you measure in your auditorium that's instrumented are you, well, going, you, know, is that, are you going to take our blood pressure while we watch these things is, what's going right. on here so there are systems where you can measure all kinds of things they said from kind of eegs you can measure um if it's individuals you can measure eye movements you can measure reaction times which uh give you an engagement of basically if you think about the the brain as a a kind of fairly linear linear machine then the time that we take to move from one task to another is indicative right. of how much we're engaged in the first half. I see. How in interesting. So I must say, one of the things that we would love to have here is something that would gauge the audience's reaction to whatever it is yeah. we're saying. I hope that everyone's engaged, but I've got absolutely no idea whether everyone's awake or asleep. I'm hoping they're awake. Um, we've got a couple more minutes left. So, so David, thank you. But I'm just going to move on to Becky just to, uh, to, to, as we sort of come to the close of this, just to get your sense of what, you know, when you look across where we've got this incredible range, not just of immersive technologies, but 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 artificial intelligence that we've mentioned, 5G that we haven't, but that speeds things up and makes things more mobile and more flexible. What's your sense of, of, of where this is going and what kinds of experiences are really going to engage big audiences in the next five to 10 years? Oh, you, you've left me a really easy question, I see, um, at the end. Um, <laughs> Pure speculation. Yeah. No one's going to tell you to it. Um, it's, uh, well, I mean, it, it's going to be fascinating. I think, I mean, I mean, uh, we talk about immersive, in, in my sphere, we talk about immersive, as this, and we use it a lot, as this big umbrella term. But within that, there's so many nuances, obviously, of, of experiences. And... Um, uh, we've seen, you know, a huge amount of sort of virtual um, uh, storytelling experiences, but you know, more virtual reality experiences, less so so far of augmented reality um, storytelling. There are some examples, but I think, you know, uh, in the next sort of five, ten years, this increased um, uh, availability and the, the sort of future of ubiquitous AR products of all kinds, not just consumer, not just entertainment experiences, um, that, that's going to um, be a really interesting area to watch, I think. Um, and I think, um, I, yeah, I think it will be, I, I'm interested to see what, you know, what this, ex, what this, particularly this moment in time we're at now, what effect this has on particularly on collaborative and shared experiences of any kind, whether it's for, you know, a, a business sense and collaborative design and things like that, or, you know, big mass consumer audience experiences, but shared experiences. I think that that drive is, 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 is higher than it's ever been before for that kind of experience. So I, I think um, I'm looking forward to seeing what that looks like.
Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. And sorry to cut you off, but we are absolutely out of time now. Um, and uh, we're under very, very, very strict rules here. So uh, just at least leaves me to thank you um, uh, all for coming and watching and taking part in this shared experience. Uh, thank you, Becky, Dave and Emma uh, from Sky. Uh, we're absolutely delighted by um, all of your contributions. And I hope that people got something really great out of today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy and team. Uh, what a fascinating insight into how R&D between universities and companies and on the back of changes in consumer behavior with COVID-19 are accelerating innovation in virtual and immersive technologies, emerging technologies in the UK creative industries and how there's so much more opportunity out there. As Andrew Thompson said, a springboard for something even bigger and better. The good news is that four of our panelists, including Jeremy and Andrew, are available now for Q&A. So for those of you in the audience with priority passes, do join our session speakers for Q&A at one o'clock. Just remain where you are and it will start on time. And to all of those who don't have a priority pass, you've still got the opportunity to visit Digital Catapult's Expo booth, where you can find out more about the work they're doing in the Createch area, and you can get to know the people you need to be put in touch with. But just before any of these, Digital Catapult want to take the opportunity to give you the chance to watch video clips, giving you a glimpse into two examples of creative projects they've been innovating with part of Creative XR, a digital catapult acceleration program for creative businesses working with universities. They're both great examples of immersive technologies in action. Take a look. Can we play please Immersive Histories by All Seeing Eye, followed by Common Ground by VR City. See you all again here at 2 p.m. 99% of us were never going to get the chance to fly in a Lancaster and this really is the next best thing. Immersive Histories Dan Busters is a uh, experience which allows audiences to join the crew of the first aircraft to attack the Myrna Dam in the Dam Busters, Operation Chastise. Until you take off the helmet, you're there and that's it. It's one thing to learn about it, it's one thing to talk about it, it's a whole different thing to experience it. All Seeing Eye was uh, founded about two and a half years ago, so we're quite a small company. We look for a way to leverage um, new technology, virtual reality, mixed reality, and we kind of find a way that they can be used to tell a kind of interesting and new stories. You can treat this as an experience and start to learn about what these men went through. It's going to enhance your knowledge uh, in a very emotional way. The inspiration for the project essentially comes from the notion of do not touch signs in museums. We wanted to make a project where people were encouraged to touch and explore and understand what it might have been like to be in a World War II bomber or warplane. The experience is, is, is totally immersive. Oh my god, it was fabulous. I'm related to Arthur Buck, who was a rear gunner in the Dam Busters raid. So be able to come here and be able to get even a little bit of a feel for what he might have experienced is, is very special. Such an amazing, incredible story that doesn't require any embellishment or, or anything because it's, it, it sounds so crazy that you can't quite believe it's true. I think that the equipment that you're wearing really adds to the experience. Both the audience members are wearing an HTC Vive Pro headset and on the front of the headset there's uh, the Leap Motion device which uh, is used for hand tracking and each of the audience is also wearing a haptic vest and then underneath the physical set itself there's a series of speakers which allow you to feel the, feel the rumble in your, in, in your feet also. Even though they have all of this kit on, after a couple of minutes it all disappears and it feels as if you're actually there. It's kind of magic when you see them kind of believe that they're in Lancaster above the Myrna Dam in 1943. That was so lifelike. It was, oh, you were there. We approached RAF Museum because it felt like a kind of spiritual home for the project. They were straight away super excited about the idea and, and really happy to wanting to be, be a part of it. The Dan Busters virtual reality experience is a very different way of telling the story and uh, we're hoping to introduce it to a new generation. 
The whole project was an exploration into making the world of the physical come together with the world of the digital and the VR headset. And there's been some quite significant challenges along the way to make sure that the digital and the physical kind of mesh together perfectly. And we wanted it to be as authentic as we can and as close to that, close to the reality as we can. I don't think we could have done this without Robert Owens, the official six on seven squadron historian. Robert was able to run through our experience and say, this is all fantastic, but you've got that bit wrong, that bit wrong, that bit wrong, and that bit wrong. And he was able to kind of help us edit and tweak and put things in the right direction to make it more historically accurate. In terms of replicating the interior of a Lancaster, it's, it's all there visually. So you can actually see everything that they would have seen. This is a serious investigation into how new technology can be used to interpret history and communicate it to a new generation. Being a part of Creative XR has been fantastic. Without Digital Catapult and Arts Council England's um, involvement, the project just wouldn't have happened. They've been kind of absolutely instrumental in helping to grow the immersive sector, which is what we're all trying to do. They've kind of given us fantastic facilities and workshops, and I guess most importantly, the network of people they're able to introduce us to. Being part of the initial 20 to, to, and the chance to kind of develop a prototype and try out an idea that we didn't really know if it was going to work properly was fantastic. And then. It was even better to have the funding to, um, to take the project forwards to make it, a, make it a real thing. We're making the idea that we want to make rather than making something that a client is asking us to make. And that doesn't really happen very much, if ever, in the, in the commercial sector. It's about the history of the estate, why it was built, what it was replacing, and then the years where things started to go wrong. Common Ground is a virtual reality documentary set here on the Aylesbury estate. It mixes 360 video, interaction, 3D modeling, and to try and tell a documentary in a new way with a new medium about social housing, but also about the effects of regeneration on communities like this. It was a really good place to bring up a family. That's why I chose to live in this area. I run a company with my business partner called East City Films. We've been going for 12 years now. We started making virtual reality uh, in, at the end of 2014. The inspiration to make this really comes from my roots as a Londoner. I'm a South Londoner. And so I've always been aware of this estate and it's always sort of fascinated me. It was the largest housing estate in Europe when it was built and the community is really rich and varied. There are, at its peak, seven and a half thousand people living here. It's quite a notorious estate. It's always portrayed as a very sort of gritty and deprived area. Now the estate is going through a regeneration process. All of the blocks that you see here are going to be knocked down and new flats are going to be built here. I hope people understand the sense of betrayal that people feel that a lot of people here are leaseholders. That means that they bought their flats. They're not social housing tenants. But now they are being forced to move. They're being given a compulsory purchase order, a CPO. And that means that whatever the local authority or the housing association, in this case, offer them, they have to accept and they have to move on. What happens to those people that used to live here? So there was a challenge, not only to understand the technology, but also how to tell a story in that new medium. In like most normal documentaries, you're able to use archive in a very traditional way. You cut to it, you use it to illustrate points that people are making. But one of the challenges we had is how do we do that in 360 when you're in an immersive environment where, where you can't cut to a screen uh, of 2D material. So one of the uh, solutions that we had for that was to use projections and a sort of projection mapping on the environment itself. Through the various mediums we use to tell the story in VR, through 360 video and 3D environments, I think that really helped people to empathise with the residents um, who we interviewed and to get a real sense of what it's like to live on the estate and deal with what they're having to go through at the moment. Maybe you're growing up around the time, the 80s and the 90s, when things started to go particularly wrong. And as it does in VR, it gives you that context, it gives you that history whilst standing in the middle of it, being able to look around, being able to feel it, to hear from some architect in 1967 his ideas and his ambitions for it, 
on a piece of grainy black and white footage projected on a wall like this. In this project we use photogrammetry and this is where we take a area of the estate, a pretty small area, mainly like a flat or a stairwell, we take thousands of photos of that, of that space. Going around in a very methodical grid-like pattern, capturing all the different angles, and then feeding them into some software to basically build a 3D model of her room. Drop it into Unity, put the headset on, and just stand there in a flat on the Ellsbury Estate. It's an incredibly unique experience. It's like, wow, I'm standing where it is now. I'm really feeling that. But this just is incredible. The 3D models, you can move around, you can draw on the walls. It was really important for us to use that technique to really deepen this documentary and deepen the connection of the audience with the Aylesbury Estate. Simply put, this project wouldn't have happened without CreativeXR and Digital Catapult and the Arts Council in supporting us in the way that they have. For us, a big reason for making this film, and it seemed that CreativeXR were on the same page, was about furthering what VR documentary can be. The real important part of it for me was the actual prototype funding that we got at the initial stage. Actually having a bit of money to then go out and start kind of exploring ways in which we could take that story which was in our heads and start to visualise it, learning new techniques and exploring new ways of storytelling really was, uh, yeah, invaluable. Once we went into production, Creative XR were fully supportive gave us structure, gave us deadlines to hit, but they did also trust us, believed in us to do what we set out to do. The immediate plans for this piece of work now that it's finished, uh, it's having its world premiere in New York at the Tribeca Film Festival. When we come back from New York, we're actually doing a private view, an exhibition here on the estate at the ASC Gallery. And that was a commitment that we had made uh, when we decided to work on the estate. that We really wanted to bring the piece back to the residents and engage with the community. The Ellsbury isn't alone in that it's being regenerated. It isn't alone in having people served compulsory purchase orders. It is happening all over the country. So we're going to be taking the film to as many estates as we can all over the country. We want to get to the communities that this might really speak to. I think in terms of influencing change, the whole Ellsbury story is a fascinating one. And having this film so clearly documenting a major part of it when we're on the real cusp of change is, is going to be really, really important and will hopefully go, go on to influence decision makers and urban planners in the future. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.